Perhaps the most familiar and most mysterious megalithic structure in all the world is the Great Pyramid of Giza. The enormous size and weight of the stones, multiplied by the sheer number of them, makes one thing certain. The construction of the Great Pyramid remains one of the greatest marvels and mysteries of architectural engineering. The pyramids at Giza are marvels of engineering, and there are many theories about how they were constructed, from the mundane to the fantastic. There are all kinds of theories on how the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. So many theories, you just sit back and shake your head. And that includes ET visitations, uh, levitating the, the blocks with some kind of sound system. One place we can learn a lot about Egyptian stone cutting methods is from the so called unfinished obelisk. Here we have a 1,000 ton obelisk made of granite, which was abandoned midway through the project because of a crack that developed. This stone, because it is unfinished, gives us direct insight into how they cut and shaped granite, as well as other stones. On the sides, we can see how these stones were separated from the quarry. A team of workers would line up side by side and pound their sections with a diorite pounding stone. Such pounding stones can be found all over this and other quarries in Egypt. This pounding only broke off millimeters of granite at a time, but eventually these trough-like sections emerged at each worker's station. After that, they would do the same thing on the bottom of the block, until it was supported only by a thin spine in the middle. Then it would be snapped off using levers. The people who created the Moai statues at Easter Island used very similar methods for quarrying stone, as did many other groups around the world, as we will see. After the stones had been roughly shaped using pounding stones, they would then begin to polish them with grinders. There have been many types of stone grinders or polishers found in ancient Egypt. They usually had a handle with a flat surface, which they would use to rub against the stone with sand as the abrasive. They were, well, sanding the stone. The various mineral particles found in sand are hard enough not only to polish hard stones like granite, but also to do what ancient aliens tries to make people think is utterly impossible, that is, to cut granite. The Egyptians had a variety of ways to cut granite, mostly involving copper and sand. There are plenty of saw marks on granite stones in Egypt, at the granite quarries, of course, as well as certain notable ones, like the famous granite sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid. The person who was doing the sawing on the sarcophagus sawed for a while at the wrong angle before realizing his mistake and going in the right direction, which left a pretty big mark for us to study. These copper saws came in three basic styles. One was a two-person saw, like an old-time lumber saw. Another type was a small, handheld saw with a wooden handle. And finally, there was a tubular saw for making holes in granite and other stones. These saws are depicted in several Egyptian reliefs. Interestingly, they didn't require saw teeth to work. They only required sand to be placed between the saw and the stones. The sand was what did the cutting. This particular method of stone cutting has been tested by ancient Egyptian tool experts. And not only was it done, but it was apparently quite easy to do. However, sawing granite with copper was expensive because the copper would wear out somewhat quickly. Therefore, you mostly see granite in ancient Egypt being worked with pounding stones, finished with grinders and chisels. The saw work was reserved primarily for royal projects like that of the sarcophagus. All of this really makes ancient aliens lose credibility, because all throughout the series, they make it sound like working with granite was only possible using diamond-tipped alien power tools. But, as all this relates to the Great Pyramid's construction, it's important to remember that almost none of the pyramid is made from granite, except for a few things like the roof supports for the king's chamber. Most of the stone was sandstone and limestone. About 85% of the stone used in the construction of the pyramids was relatively soft sandstone, which was quarried right on site. That's right, the Great Pyramid was built right in the middle of a massive sandstone quarry, which was no doubt at least one factor in choosing the location to build it. The other 15% of the stones, like that of limestone and granite, 
would have to be brought in from a slightly further away location. So this raises another question. What about moving these stones? Surely the only way is by levitation, as Ancient Aliens claims. In order to really move massive amounts of stone like that, they would have had to have been levitated, somehow made weightless, and then just moved through the air by some kind of device, perhaps even a handheld kind of device, like some beam weapon. If levitation was the way that the ancient Egyptians moved stones, they had a funny way of showing it because there are plenty of depictions of them using wooden sleds to move everything from blocks the size and shape of the ones used for the pyramid to massive 1,000-ton monuments and obelisks, all using wooden sleds. They even had a hieroglyph for the word sled, which they used often. In fact, three such sleds have been found intact by archaeologists, and they have all kinds of places to attach ropes to. Speaking of ropes, ropes made out of papyrus and other materials have been found in Egypt, some of them with a massive circumference, suggesting that they were used for extremely heavy objects. Boats were used for stones that needed to be imported. In fact, a channel was dug from the Nile to the construction site, so no stone had to be dragged very far anyway. So, what about the construction of the pyramids? How exactly was it done? Part of the reason that the ancient aliens' perspective is attractive is because some of the other popular theories concerning the pyramid's construction have serious problems, such as the single ramp theory, which would have had to extend out more than a mile and would have had to have more stones in it than the pyramid itself. Another one is the spiral ramp theory. This one is problematic because some of the ledges only had about two feet or less to work with, certainly not enough to hold a ledge that would carry workers and stones the size of the ones used. Also, a structure like the pyramid would have had to have been constantly monitored for geometric accuracy as it progressed upwards, because being even a few inches off on a lower level could cause the top to be off by a huge amount, and a spiral ramp would have made it impossible to survey the geometric accuracy of the pyramid as it progressed. Add to this that there's no actual evidence for either of those theories, and you can see why people are looking for alternatives. While doing research for this documentary, I came across a new theory about the pyramid's construction that I had not heard before. At first, I planned to mention it only briefly, but the more I heard of this theory, the more convinced I became of its validity. It was proposed not by an Egyptologist, but by an eccentric French architect named Jean-Pierre Houdin. And if Jean-Pierre is correct... Knowing how the blocks were raised in the pyramid also happens to explain some of the other mysteries, like the purpose for the odd-shaped Grand Gallery, as well as the purpose of the granite blocks above the King's Chamber, and why there were three burial chambers cut at different levels in the pyramid, two of which were unused. I will very briefly explain this theory, but I highly encourage you to visit the links at the website on your screen, because the specifics of this theory are something that any pyramid enthusiast should be very familiar with, in my opinion. The basic idea is that there was an internal ramp in the Great Pyramid, and workers dragged the blocks through it until they reached the corners, at which point the block was repositioned for another team to pull it up the next ramp. Also, the exterior limestone blocks with the polished finish would have been positioned and aligned first to ensure geometric accuracy, and then the sandstone blocks would have been positioned behind them as filler. This would mean that all the internal chambers, like the Queen and King's Chamber, were built as the pyramid progressed upwards in the light of day. This internal ramp theory, unlike some of the others, is actually supported by quite a lot of physical evidence. For example, in the 1980s, a French team, looking for hidden chambers, conducted a full-scale gravimetric survey of the Great Pyramid, kind of like a giant X-ray map of the entire pyramid. They actually found evidence of this internal ramp through their study, but they had no idea what to think of the spiral pattern they saw at the time, so they simply filed it away until they heard about Jean-Pierre's internal ramp theory 14 years later. In addition, there is this notch high up on the Great Pyramid, which, according to Jean-Pierre, rests exactly on the 7% grade where you would expect to find the internal ramp, and would be at the exact place where the workers would have lifted the blocks and changed the direction for the pullers. 
Bob Breyer, an Egyptologist who was working with Jean-Pierre, was only allowed a few minutes to survey this notch and take a few pictures and measurements. They found that there was indeed a large space behind these stones, and they made extensive computer models with the pictures that were taken. As of 2012, the team is still waiting for clearance from the Egyptian authorities to conduct a full-scale survey of this notch. But perhaps even more interesting than this is the purpose for the Grand Gallery and the granite stones above the King's Chamber. I mention them together because, according to Jean-Pierre, they are intimately connected. First, it's important to know the main difference between the Great Pyramid and the other two pyramids at Giza is that the Great Pyramid's burial chamber was inside the pyramid. The other two were underground, cut directly into the bedrock, which meant that in those two pyramids they did not have to worry about the hundreds of thousands of tons of stone above it collapsing onto the tomb. The Great Pyramid was different. Its chambers were in the middle of the pyramid, and because of this, the designer had to get creative to prevent the stones from collapsing in on the chambers. In earlier pyramids in the area, this had been accomplished using a stone roof that came together at an apex, which distributed the weight of the blocks away from the chamber. But for the Great Pyramid, the designer wanted to be more ornate, opting for a flat roof in the king's chamber, which would have easily collapsed if he didn't find a way to distribute the weight of the stones above it away from the roof. He ingeniously added a series of large granite blocks, spaced out evenly above the chamber, capping those stones with the same apex roof idea from the earlier pyramids, which distributed the weight safely away from the king's chamber ceiling. This did indeed solve the problem of the weight of the stones collapsing the chamber, but it caused another problem. How could you get those granite stones up there for placement? They would have been too big for the internal ramp, and too heavy, even at a 7% incline. For the solution, we look to the Grand Gallery. The Grand Gallery has puzzled Egyptologists ever since it was discovered. It's such an odd shape, and it doesn't seem to make sense to construct it the way it's constructed if it's simply a path to get from point A to point B. This has led to much speculation about its purpose. Jean-Pierre has proposed that the Grand Gallery was used as a massive counterweight system where a wooden trolley was loaded with stones and rigged with ropes and was used to provide the force to lift the heaviest objects. Basically, it was the equivalent of a freight elevator. There is actually a lot of physical evidence for this too, and it explains all kinds of peculiar details about the Grand Gallery. For example, the odd holes in the so-called benches of the Grand Gallery were used to connect a wooden guide system for the trolley. It also explains why there are remnants of grease as well as scratches along the bottom of the chamber where the trolley would have rubbed against the stone. It was apparently lubricated to make it run smoother. It explains the odd way the stones were worn at the top of the so-called step of the Grand Gallery, exactly where the ropes would have had to be. This area has now been cemented over to make a step, but you can see in the old pictures what it looked like when the first explorers arrived. This freight elevator would have required a small external ramp, which there is some evidence for, and even those who oppose the long, single ramp theory agree that there probably was a small ramp at the beginning of the construction. This ramp would have been dismantled after the completion of the king's chamber, and the stones would have been dragged up the internal ramp to finish the rest of the pyramid. Jean-Pierre and his team have made a lot of converts to this idea, including a number of well-respected Egyptologists and pyramid experts. But as of 2012, they are still in the final stages of being approved by the Egyptian government for more work on the site. Houdin's idea of an internal ramp, I think, uh, is coherent. I think there's good circumstantial evidence for it. If you have watched the National Geographic special uh, on his view, I think you would agree that there is good circumstantial evidence for it. It has a, has a lot of explanatory power for a lot of the fundamental questions. And I think it's important because... Houdin's theory depends on a very simple idea in engineering, both in the ancient world and in today's world, and that is the use of weight and counterweight, uh, using the weight of one object to lift a, an object of greater weight. Whether or not this theory proves to be perfectly true in every respect will hopefully soon be seen. But I at least hope that by now, most of us can see that these construction techniques are well within the capability of mankind to conceive of and to do without the intervention of aliens.